Hello, Market Insights Watchers and Market Roundup. Traders' wagers are shifting on first quarter Fed rate cuts. Find out why. In Tech Megatrends, a new Bloomberg survey forecasts a rise in AI server demand, which is expected to boost certain chip stocks this year. I'll share two ways to aim to capture those coming gains. In Crypto Corner, Ian will give his latest insights. And lastly, in this week's Market Insights Mailbag, Ian will answer a special request to share his, his interest rate forecast for 2024. So let's get to it. Hello, Ian. So how are you today? How was your weekend? It was good. Uh, I got a couple of sick kids, so sleepless nights. Oh, no. um, but everyone's feeling better and okay. get excited to get into the week. Where's Alex, by the way? Alex is right here. He's right in his doggy bed. I'm going to try and get him on our recording for Strategic Fortunes for tomorrow. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> is, is he going to make a special appearance at the Total Wealth Symposium? Yes, he shall be there. All right. so awesome. Meet Alex in person in Orlando. <laughs> he will be there. You in Orlando in February. Yes, in February. Mm -hmm. But before we even begin with market, with our market roundup, I have to share this with Market Insights Nation. We have a big announcement coming next month in February. It's something Ian has been working on for, I say, the last year, and we're putting the final touches on it right now. So we mm -hmm. ask that you please stay tuned for more details to come. Quite exciting information yeah I'm, I'm really excited uh for everyone to see what we've been working on because you know amber i found um in my career in investing that you have to not follow what everybody else is doing right so if you if you if you think conventionally about the market you're going to get conventionally returns if you just mm -hmm. simply follow the herd you're going to perform just like the regular market is um, and what we've done using AI and big data and lots of man and computer power is basically tweak like a 40 year old indicator that was very, very effective, but just kind of maneuver it a little bit so that it increases the probability of winning trades again. And I like to think of it as like, do you know, have you ever used the Waze app? Not Ian. Of course, heard of it. Never used okay, it. Okay. So Waze app is like a maps app, but. Mm -hmm. If there's traffic, it tells you to take a different route. And Google Maps will do this sometimes. Waze just does a little more effectively. Mm -hmm. And I think of this strategy as imagine if you know you're driving home during the rush hour commute and there's traffic, but then there's like a slightly different path that you can take on on sort of a local road uh, that can make your commute as fast as it was before the traffic happens. What the problem that we see in markets is that everyone starts to follow the same indicators, the same strategies after a while, and they're not as effective as they were. So what we've done is basically use a lot, a, a ton of data and lots of computational power to find a quicker path to our objective. Um, and I'm excited to share this with everyone in the next couple of weeks. So you'll hear more about it in the future. Oh, yes. Stay tuned, everyone. So cool, Ian. Okay, so in market roundup, uh, traders are dialing back their wagers of a first quarter rate cut. Uh, personally, I thought it was a little ambitious and actually believe rates will remain higher for just a bit more and longer. Uh, recent U.S. economic data continue to show, Ian, and everyone the strength of the U.S. economy. Uh, data like December stronger than expected retail sales, which saw resilient U.S. consumers pump money into clothing, uh, general merchandise, as well as e-commerce uh, purchases. Santa was good to the kids this year. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? He was awesome to <laughs> kids this year. I mean, unbelievable. Uh -huh. um, data like the latest uh, U.S. home purchase applications, uh, which climbed to an almost six-month high as mortgage rates started a recent decline. And lastly, data showing January's preliminary consumer sentiment soaring to the biggest level since 2021, far exceeding expectations. And the survey showed that more than half of U.S. households anticipate that their incomes will be increasing at least as fast as inflation this year. Hmm. Um, now, we understand the Fed officials want to make certain that inflation is well at hand, well tamed before even beginning to cut any rates. Now, checking the latest U.S. interest rate probability table, uh, chances of a rate cut for March now stand at 46.5% from 78% a year ago. I'm a year ago. 
listen to me, a week ago, uh, rate cut probabilities remain high for May and June's Fed meetings at 80% and 94.8% respectively. So Ian, your take. Love to hear what you're thinking on this. Well, first things first, Amber, amazing update. It was like a lot of information there. But, you know, like everyone came into 2023 thinking that rates were really high. The Fed's going to have to raise rates, squash inflation. That's going to cause a recession. The Fed raised rates really high, but the economy had enough underlying strength because of a lot of fiscal stimulus. I mean, let's face it, there were some, you know, major legislation acts that were passed, which pushed a lot of money to the economy um, mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. It's still, you know, not, uh, we, we haven't had a recession. Um, and I think this is like the the, the recession that everybody picked, uh, if it was gonna be a hard landing or a soft landing, hasn't materialized. It's kind of like we didn't have a landing, you know? So think about like the plane coming down right? The plane is the economy. Right. And it's like, are we going to have a soft landing? One of those landings where it just kind of touches the runway. You don't even know that you're not flying anymore. Mm -hmm. Hard landing where it's like, you ever been on a plane where it just kind of hits the runway, you know, when it's windy? Mm -hmm. it, it feels more like, you know, we almost refueled the plane in midair. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of uh, flying from Florida to Ohio, we're going to California. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like we're just going to keep on going. And and that's what it really feels like. You've got inflation has come down. True inflation is showing below three percent. The the data that we look at um, and, you know, you, you still have like weekly jobless claims are still running hot. Like you said, December uh, consumer sales were strong. Mm -hmm. Mortgage applications are picking up again. And, you know, we, we might not be going back to three percent interest rates, mm -hmm. two percent interest rates. But, you know, we're not going to be at 8%. And so I think the economy is going to kind of find a happy medium uh, where rates are kind of where they were in the 90s and 2000s. And, and it, 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 you're not getting free money from the banks, but, you know, it, it, it's cheap enough that the economy can grow. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good, a good comparison to mm -hmm. our lives back in the 90s. Okay, Ian. So let's move to- Remember those days, Amber? Oh, yeah, very well. <laughs> As a, as, as a kid, those days were the bomb. <laughs> <laughs> so in tech megatrends, a new Bloomberg Chief Information Officer Survey, our CIO for short, uh, from Bloomberg Intelligence, gives some really great forecasts on a rise in artificial intelligence server demand. Uh, this is expected to boost certain chip stocks this year, 2024. In fact, the CIO survey shows corporate investment in IT infrastructure is set to increase, which could boost sales for high performance DRAM, which is short for dynamic random access memory. Now, DRAM semiconductors are needed by, oh, well, let's say computer processors to actually function uh, by, by like I'm thinking of servers, workstations, your PC and your house, it's all needed. So the survey also found that orders for NAND, a type of read write, uh, write uh, storage chip could improve this year after a week 2023 and boost shipments for certain chip makers. So more on those specific chip making companies in a moment, everyone. But in all, oh, the survey showed, and I have to quote this because it's really good. 64% uh, of corporations in the US have an IT infrastructure utilization rate exceeding 80% of which 43% operate at 90% or more. Uh, this implies nearly half of companies are running at almost full capacity. Among CIOs surveyed, 44% uh, say they plan to expand IT infrastructure capacity within the next six months, and 77% aim to do so within a year. And a rebound in enterprise IT investment could boost demand across a wide variety of semiconductors and electronic parts, such as DRAM and NAND, end quote. So here are two ways, I was thinking about this, to invest in this potential memory market trend. Uh, first, well, you consider buying some shares in Micron Technology, that ticker is MU. Orders for NAND could rebound this year and increase shipments by uh, semiconductor companies like Micron, which is a major supplier of NAND memory chips. Second, if you're not yet a subscriber to Ian's Strategic Fortunes Research Service, his monthly newsletter service, consider becoming one. Uh, we'd love to have you on board. Now in Strategic Fortunes model portfolio, 
we have currently um, recommended AI and chip stocks. One is up and open trade is up as much as 282% right now. And that could also benefit from a rise in AI, that, that trend. So please, if you may, please click the bull icon right here over my shoulder for more details on strategic fortunes and how to get started. So that's it for Dram and Nan. Isn't that interesting uh, survey? There? I I love it. I mean, I know we don't own Micron and Strategic Fortunes, but have you ever heard the story of how this company was founded? No, I don't think so. I so I, 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 I have a lot of random access memories, Amber, so I'm going to get that now. <laughs> so the 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 founder, um, Micron is based in Boise, Idaho, which is where my wife is from. And, and Idaho is known for potatoes, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there was a, a potato chip manufacturer, this guy named J.R. Simplot. Uh, had the company. And in the late 70s, these two engineers, uh, they were brothers, the Parkinson brothers, said, you know, we have an idea to make a chip and in a, a, a microchip. And he said, well, I know how to make chips. Like I've got the largest potato chip company in the world. Right. And they founded Micron. Wow. And, you know, it just be, it went on to become one of America's great technology companies. Mm -hmm. And 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 J.R. Simplot used his expertise in the chip making industry for making potato chips to start making microchips. It's kind of an amazing story. That is brilliant. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Who would have thought? Okay. Well, I love it, Ian. So tell before we started uh, our recording this morning, you mentioned some great information in crypto, in the crypto space on tokenization. So take it away. I'd like to hear. Yeah. That. So, I mean, the crypto markets this week, obviously, you know, I feel like we've had a, a sort of a medium term top with the Bitcoin ETF, right? Because there are a lot of traders that were buying Bitcoin at 20,000. Now that you have the ETF, it feels kind of like a sell the news event. Mm. I would be worried about selling this too hard because number one, in Bitcoin, you have the halving coming up in April, which means that the number of Bitcoin supply that will be mined mm. on a daily basis is going to be cut in half. Number two, it is more likely than not that within the next six months, we have an Ethereum ETF, and that is going to drive demand for Ethereum because now, you know, it'll be accessible easily in retirement accounts and for institutions to buy an ETF based on Ethereum. Mm -hmm. And I think other uh, ETFs will follow most likely Solana and Avalanche after that. Mm -hmm. But one thing um, after the Bitcoin ETF was approved, CNBC had Larry Fink on. Larry Fink is the CEO of BlackRock. Uh, they manage $12 trillion in assets. Um, he's probably the most influential person in finance, I would say, you know, up there with Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett. Uh, he was the the basically the creator of the whole ESG movement. Um, he's been the driving force behind the Bitcoin ETF. And, and something in his interview really struck me. Um, he said, and I don't want to mash his quote up, so let me just pull it up here. Uh, he quoted that the, e the Bitcoin ETF are step one in the technological revolution in the financial markets. And he says, step two is tokenization. Now, what is tokenization? It basically is a way for you to uh, create a crypto asset that is attached to something of real world value. Okay, so when you tokenize, let's say, um, a building, you can also fractionalize it, which means that you can have multiple tokens that represent a share in a building or multiple tokens that represent a share in a company. And the thing that I've always believed is that when you think about the the grand scheme of this, like this idea of like, what what is capitalism, right, Amber? The right. essence of capitalism is the ability to more efficiently create capital formation. Mm -hmm. And that means somebody has a great idea, okay? But in order to bring that idea to market, they need to raise capital. And traditionally, you know, starting in the, the 15th century with the South uh, Sea Company in the Netherlands, it was very difficult to raise capital, right? There were only specific people that could invest in you. And, and, and then, you know, keeping track of those shares was difficult. As it got easier and easier, as capital formation got easier and easier, it underpinned some of the great innovations of our time. Because if you have an idea and you're an entrepreneur, it became easier for you to access capital. And we saw just this expand in the 20th century, right? And capitalism is the driving force between everything in our world that we own, that we've created. What tokenization is going to do is take capitalism to an entirely new level because it allows for the formation of capital across borders, across people, and you can uh, do it without having a middleman. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, in the grand scheme of like why blockchain is so important is because a blockchain keeps track of who owns what in a way that you don't need a bank or some type of middleman or an asset manager. And this is going to supercharge the way capital formation happens. And let me just give you one example of this. Mm -hmm. um, there was there was a copy of the U.S. Constitution sold about a year and a half ago. Do you remember this story? I remember seeing this, yes. And um, so someone said, I've got a great idea. Mm -hmm. Let's create a token, a crypto token, that represents a, a fractionalized share in this constitution. Mm -hmm. And whoever contributes to it uh, will we'll have something, you know, a share of it. And we'll hold the constitution in a safe place somewhere. And then you can spy and sell your representation of it. They raised over $40 million for this idea within two weeks. Okay. Wow. And none of the people who were involved knew each other. They had no economic history. They had no reason to trust anyone else other than the fact that they have the blockchain underneath it. Now, they actually didn't buy the constitution because there was a hedge fund billionaire that found out exactly how much they were raising and mm -hmm. outbid them by a million dollars. <laughs> so, you know, maybe in the future, you don't want to reveal how much that you've raised before you're going to buy whatever it is you seek to buy. But mm -hmm. to me, it's just an example of how quickly this capital formation can happen. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also going to level the playing field for investors in a lot of ways, because a lot of the big startup companies, you know, that go public now, and I'm thinking about Uber and DoorDash, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've come public after they've made a million percent or something like that for early stage investors, right? And like a retail investor can't get involved in these great companies until they go public. Hmm. With 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 crypto and tokenization of assets, you could have the early rounds available to anyone who wants to get into it. Hmm. And and I think that's going to be a game changer for investors, especially when you look at the returns of venture capital in the last decade have been so much higher than the returns of, of public market investing. And so, you know, what Larry Fink is saying basically is that this is the next step of crypto where real world assets are going to be tokenized. And what's going to be important is what are the rails that these are going to be built on? Like, how are we going to manage this world of decentralized finance when we have the entire world that's tokenized? And this is why this space is heading towards a hundred trillion dollar space because you just have to add up all the assets in the world that could be possibly tokenized, and more likely than not, most of them will be. So um, that that's why you know what Larry Fink said to me was was like spot on because I've been like tokenize everything you know over the last five six years, and finally like the world is, is starting to catch up. So okay. you know uh, we'll talk more about that in in our crypto update this week about what Larry Fink said. Oh, fantastic. I love it. Especially being ahead of the curve. That's what it's all about. Okay, mm -hmm. Ian, we're going to test your forecast. <laughs> we have a question, oh boy. <laughs> which, which you know is good. Now okay. it's from John P. Hello, John P. Thank you for writing in. John P. wrote in with the subject line of interest rates. And mm -hmm. John P. wrote, hi, Ian. I think many of us would like to know what your interest rate forecast is for 2024. Okay, great question, John P. Thanks for writing in. When we talk about interest rates, we have to like figure out where on the curve is is that interest rate that you want, right? So Fed funds futures or Fed funds, which is like the very shortest term, it just represents the rate that banks borrow from one another. Mm -hmm. You know, the rate that the Fed puts to zero in, in difficult economic times and raises to five, that's one thing. But then as you go out the treasury curve, you'll have different interest rates, right? So you have, you know, the two-year note is a benchmark, the five-year note, the 10-year note, the 30-year note. When I say, when I think of interest rates, Amber, I always think about the 10-year note. And the reason for that, the US 10-year note, is because it's the most liquid investing instrument in the world. And most spread products, which are like corporate bonds, high-yield bonds, mortgage bonds, other asset-backed securities, are based off the 10-year note. Mm -hmm. Now, the 10-year note has been as high in, in this cycle as 5%. We got to 5% in October, everybody panicked. The 10 year note started, the yield started coming back down. It dropped below four to about 3.8%. And now it's starting to inch back up as we've seen the economy is not slowing as quickly as we thought. So my interest rate prediction on where I think the 10 year note is going to end the year, drum roll? Yes. Unchanged right now. Okay. I think at the end of the year, it's likely that we will be exactly where we are at this point. And the reason for that is that if the economy was going to have a hard landing, 
then we probably have 10 year rates below 3%. Mm -hmm. If the economy was going to reaccelerate, we probably have 10 year rates above 5%. And you know, either of these might be possible. It's just what we're looking at right now is basically almost a, 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 a stasis in the economy mm -hmm. where uh, global growth is expected to come in just below 3% this year. Inflation is coming down. It's likely that the 10 year rate has kind of peaked for this cycle. We're not going to go above 5%, but I think, don't think we're going to drop too low. And like I said earlier in this webinar, it's kind of like the plane that's supposed to come in for landing, but then you realize the plane still has more fuel uh, and, and, and you keep going. So there's no hard landing, no soft landing. It's just, we're going to kind of trug along. And by the end of the year, I think we're going to be at 4%. Now, what does this mean for a spread price? Look, if you're looking to buy a home, you look at the mortgage rates, they're still six and a half percent. You know, uh, I was reading this article in the journal and it talks about how the the actual spread between mortgages and tenure notes are as wide as they've ever been. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because most mortgage investors think rates are going to go down. And when they do, I don't want to get too far into it. There's something called negative convexity and then prepayment speeds pick up. And so if you bought a mortgage bond, you lose the principal because somebody prepaid it. Um, so, but I do think that that spread of the mortgage rate will tighten to treasuries probably to like one seven one five to one seven five percent. So mortgages probably around five and a half percent by the end of the year. U.S. ten year around four percent. That's my forecast. Brilliant. I love okay. it. Okay. I love it. We can have a longer conversation about negative convexity and mortgage bonds, but <laughs> I I think I've already put everybody to sleep. No, you didn't. We're all ears. Awesome, Ian. Appreciate that. And thank you for answering John P's question. John P, thank you for writing in. Thank you, writing in. Sorry for the earful. <laughs> it's okay. Well, He's like, I'm not going to write in again. <laughs> no, please write again. in again. We love hearing from everyone who watches us. Okay. It's not a very bold prediction saying that the interest rates aren't going anywhere this year. But you know what? Everybody else thinks they're going to move. Yeah. Well, we got to think what everybody else doesn't say. No, we can't. We got to think outside the box here. Okay, everyone. So that's it for this week. We want to thank you for watching. And if you have a question or a comment, uh, please email us at marketinsights at banyanhill.com. And of course, if you're watching us on the Banyan Hill YouTube channel, uh, please make sure to subscribe, like, and share uh, those um, those icons there on on the uh, on the YouTube channel. So oh, I have a vis I have a visitor. You have a visitor who's there? Yeah, my dog. It's my dog just walked in. I guess I left the door open. Want to say hi? Yes. Okay. Please. One one of them walked in. Hold on. Wait, come here. It's Boise, everyone. Okay, yeah, come on. Boise. He's a little camera shy, but there he is. <laughs> there he is. It's Boise. Oh, jeez. I love He's, he's blind in one eye. So. Oh, adorable. He's giving his good eye right now. I All right. He's out of here. I'll, I'll leave my door closed next time. Okay. <laughs> All right. Boise is gorgeous. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Take talk care. Next.